So, good afternoon. We will continue examining the uh, different mechanisms, in plane mechanisms. We had looked at as an extension of the Mann-Muller criterion which works at the level of stresses, the extension which looks at resultant forces and we have examined one of the uh, criterion based on the flexural failure mechanism in the, uh, in the last class. So, the flexural failure mechanism when the formulation is uh, made, the formulation is based on a flexural compression failure occurring at the compressed toe. However, we also saw that as a special case of that uh, situation, if the axial compression level, the pre-compression levels are low, then you could have rigid rocking of the wall in the in-plane uh, direction itself. So, that is a special case, the overturning as a failure mechanism is a special case of the flexural, in-plane flexural mechanism itself. We will examine the other two mechanisms, um, but before we move on to the shear dominated behavior, it is useful to look at what is the cyclic response of a wall that is governed by a flexural rocking or a flexural crushing uh, mechanism itself. So, what I am going to be looking at is the hysteretic behavior, right. So, uh, since the elaboration of these uh, capacities and force displacement behavior is being done primarily with respect to um, response of masonry, response of unreinforced masonry to earthquake actions. It is important to examine the hysteretic behavior which is cyclic behavior, earthquake being uh, reverse cyclic behavior in nature and therefore, if we were to examine and compare the in-plane response for the flexural mechanisms and the in-plane response for shear mechanisms, we get a rather good understanding of how deformation capacity is available in a masonry wall, what is the status of energy dissipation in the masonry wall and where does introducing steel reinforcement and making unreinforced masonry to steel to reinforce masonry really contribute. So, it is in that context we will start examining hysteretic behavior and um, though some of you may not be familiar with cyclic response, static cyclic response is what we are trying to capture here. It is not from dynamic analysis or dynamic uh, behavior, but from a static or a quasi static behavior, uh, but it will be useful to uh, look at these graphs to get a, a better understanding of how uh, masonry walls respond to reverse cyclic loading. So, if we were to look at the flexure dominated mechanism rocking or uh, the rocking effect uh, ultimately leading to crushing of the compressed toe in a brick masonry wall. Uh, I am looking at laboratory tests because you can examine these in a controlled environment. You can apply uh, perfect in plane loads in an earthquake you have a combination of uh, actions coming onto a masonry wall because of the randomness of the ground motion itself. So, we are looking at a laboratory test where the wall panel that you are looking at is um, a shear wall, it is subjected to gravity uh, loads. So, the actuators that you see at the top, the jacks that you see at the top are actually uh, subjecting the wall to a desired level of pre-compression and this is to idealize the uh, gravity forces superimposed on the wall itself. So, if, if we were to look at this wall as a ground story wall in a multi storied building, then I can regulate the pre-compression level based on what is the expected pre-compression level in the ground story wall. If it were a single storied wall, you reduce the pre-compression levels such that probably only the weight of the parapet and the slab is the superimposed load on the wall itself. So, it is a convenient way of introducing the level of uh, superimposed load and then subjecting the wall to lateral forces. In this case, you have the lateral, uh, you have the actuator in the lateral direction which is uh, applying the um, in-plane shear forces, um, trying to simulate the kind of damage that is expected in an earthquake, but under 
a quasi static condition of loading itself. So, the wall has boundary conditions, you can fix it at the base, the top is free to rotate and so you again um, are able to mimic the boundary conditions expected in a real building. Uh, if you want to um, prevent the rotations at the top, then you can create a setup which does not allow rotations at the top and takes you towards a shear deformation profile of the wall itself. But those are, those are important choices that have to be made before such a test is carried out. So, when um, what you are seeing are tests conducted in our laboratory. You see a, a masonry wall, this was constructed using fly ash bricks and as you can see it is uh, rather slender meaning the height is more than the, uh, the length of the wall itself and typically we refer to walls as slender walls when the height to length uh, ratio is greater than about 1.5. So, this is a slender wall that we are examining and as you can see the black lines that you see at the bottom are actually the cracks that have formed as the wall is subjected to the lateral force under the presence of gravity forces and this is reverse cyclic. So, you go from the 0 position to a positive maximum, come back to 0 when you unload and then you go to the negative maximum and come back. So, it is this cyclic but reversed cyclic, positive and negative cycles and that is why you see that the crack at the base, the black line that you see at the base on both the ends, the tension, the heel cracking is happening at both the ends with the reverse cyclic loading and if the level of pre-compression is low, considering that this is a slender wall, you can even get the entire cross section that can get cracked and uh, depending on the pre-compression level again, you might get a shear sliding failure or you might get rocking uh, of the wall itself. So, this is a wall that underwent rocking and the hysteretic behavior which is captured from the experiment. You get the cyclic response of the structure of the wall and then we look at an envelope curve across uh, over all the cycles that the wall is taken through. So, the thick black line that you see here, the thick black line that you see in the positive quadrant and the negative quadrant is the envelope curve. That is the envelope of the overall response and represents the force displacement uh, behavior uh, in the positive cycle and in the negative cycle and typically we look at either both or an average of the two or uh, the positive curve and the negative curve uh, whichever is uh, the absolute maximum of the response itself. So, what we are actually observing here is a wall that is that has undergone rocking. Okay. There are a few aspects that you need to um, understand from such a hysteretic curve. What you are seeing is force versus displacement. So, from the envelope curve at the maximum displacement versus a sort of a yield displacement that could be defined and defining what is the yield displacement of the wall is something that is uh, subjective, empirical. It could vary depending on the method that you use to establish what the yield displacement is because you do not see um, very clearly like in reinforced concrete systems or in steel systems the formation of the, uh, the phenomenon of yielding is not seen so clearly in, in a material like masonry and therefore, um, it becomes subjective depending on the method that you choose um, the estimate of the yield displacement itself. If you were to take uh, make an estimate of the yield displacement and then look at the maximum displacement that the wall is uh, capable of um, resisting and I have uh, if I have now a ratio of the maximum displacement to the yield displacement, the ratio gives me an of the displacement ductility, uh, ductility of the wall itself. So, from the envelope curve, it is possible to get an estimate of the deformation capacity of the wall quantified in terms of ductility available in the wall. Two, if you look at each loop, which is the force displacement excursion in the positive and the negative and if you look at one excursion, the area under the curve is representing the energy dissipated in one cycle. Of course, in the elastic cycles, you do not have energy dissipation, 
and as you start seeing damage in the wall, that is when cracking is occurring and uh, there is energy dissipation. So particularly in the inelastic cycles, in each uh, force displacement loop in a cycle, the area under the force displacement uh, loop is the energy dissipated. When you look at flexural rocking mechanisms in comparison to uh, shear dominated mechanisms, there are two things that are typically observed. One is that significant deformation capacity is available in the wall. That is, since the wall is rocking, okay, and it, if the pre-compression levels are low, it can continue to undergo rigid rocking. The pre-compression levels are heavy, are high, then you can get flexural compression failure at the compressed toe. So in this particular mechanism, because of the rocking behavior, deformation capacities or the ductility that is available in the system is significant. Okay? For an unreinforced system, this is the maximum displacement uh, ductility that you might, you might get. And if you actually qualitatively look at the graph, you can see that delta max is about three to four times the yield displacement. Okay, so your question was, um, in the case of significant pre-compression levels, failure in a flexural mechanism is expected by the, the crushing of the compressed toe. Yes, so what typically would happen in a reverse cyclic scenario is that one of the toes, one of the toes would reach crushing failure at the beginning of the, uh, at the beginning of a cycle that is taking the wall to the maximum displacement. So with that, we have to stop the test because you have seen failure in the wall and we do not bring it back because then it causes instability um, due to one end already crushed and symmetry lost in the wall. So typically that is observed in the, in the figure that we have been seeing in the other class. You see that the crushing failure is always at, uh, at one end. So we stop at that point as far as the test is concerned. So uh, what I was mentioning earlier is that if you look at this graph, qualitatively you will say that the maximum displacement is three to four or even more uh, than the yield displacement. Okay? So uh, depending on the typology of masonry, this ratio can vary and um, we are not immediately examining this number, but I would like you to keep in mind the fact that the displacement ductility is significantly higher when you have flexural rocking mechanisms in comparison to shear mechanisms. The second thing that you see is of course we have not compared this hysteretic um, behavior with any other mechanism, any other hysteretic curve particularly dominated by shear mechanism. But what you observe are these loops of hysteresis are rather narrow loops, okay? are rather narrow loops implying that the area under the loop is going to be small and the energy dissipated, if you were to estimate what is the area under the loop for a force displacement curve, you will see that it is small in comparison to uh, other mechanisms or if you were to reinforce a wall. So the point is, and the reason why it is low, energy dissipation is low, is that you get a, a tensile heel crack formed in the wall and probably that might extend to about 80, 85 percent of the length of the wall and if the wall were not going to crush at the compressed toe, then the wall is simply going to go rocking back and forth. There is no possibility of energy dissipation in the wall. It's already a pre-formed crack plane that you have and it's just going rocking along that crack plane. There is no further inelasticity occurring in the system to dissipate energy. So uh, hysteretic behavior in a in-plane flexural mechanism is typically characterized by good deformation capacity, good ductility, but low energy dissipation capacity. And that's a little bit of a paradox because when you have earthquake response, when you want good earthquake response, you want good deformation capacity, but you also want good energy dissipation. And that's uh, difficult to achieve if your wall that's the why once you reinforce your wall, it's then possible for you to achieve the deformation capacity, but also have good uh, energy dissipation. So uh, unreinforced masonry in earthquake applications doesn't make too much of sense because you will not be able to achieve these twin requirements uh, for good earthquake response. 
No, energy dissipation is the uh, input energy into a system during an earthquake has to be dissipated by way of formation of uh, damage, right. A system is able to absorb the input energy and convert that input energy into something because that energy, if a large energy is input into the structure, it has to find a way of, dis of, of losing that energy or converting that energy into something. If you have a wall that is capable of deforming inelastically but not failing, not reaching any failure mechanism, that is a successful system because you are able to dissipate energy and yet remain that stable is for, right, that, is ductility. that is ductility. So you have deformation capacity, yes. but deformation capacity alone is not sufficient because there is input energy into a system and you need to be able to uh, dissipate energy uh, which is the earthquake energy that is input into the system from the ground. Now rocking is good, but if you look at the hysteretic curve for rocking, it is typically a thin curve. You are not able to dissipate energy by rocking alone. You are able to get the displacement capacity, the displacement, good displacement behavior, but you are not able to dissipate energy. You need to achieve both. Okay, so let us keep this in mind and come back when we examine the shear deformation behavior itself. Okay, let us move on to the in plane shear mechanisms and the in plane shear mechanisms of interest to us um, in the in plane direction. <coughs> there are two major shear failure modes that, um, that can be identified as independent shear failure modes. However, life is not so straightforward, we can have a combination of failure modes and that is uh, that is a problem because it can start. Um, making it difficult to have clean closed form solutions for each mechanism. When you have combined modes, it becomes a problem to work with these uh, expressions. However, this is a good starting point. So the two shear failure modes are the diagonal cracking um, mode. In the Mann-Muller criterion, we have examined this, which is the formation of the tension cracks, the diagonal tension cracks in the center of the brick. And we used a formulation based on um, when the principal tension reaches the tensile strength of the unit. It is it is based on a similar approach, diagonal cracking is, um, is occurring when the principal tension reaches the tensile strength of masonry. So that is your first mechanism of shear failure. The second mechanism of shear failure is what we have um, seen earlier, the shear sliding failure which, where, which is expected to occur at a bed joint. There will be a critical bed joint and typically you are looking at uh, the bed joint that is uh, which has the maximum uh, pre-compression level typically where the maximum demand is also coming and therefore uh, it could be the, the first uh, bed joint le level or the second bed joint level or so on. So shear sliding is the second criterion. Now this criterion is what you would, this failure mode is what you would link with in the Mann-Muller criterion where we had the failure of the motor joint. We had a formulation based on the Mohr Coulomb criterion where the failure of the motor joint was one of the uh, failure modes. In fact, the first failure mode that we looked at was the Mohr Coulomb criterion. Tau is equal to uh, cohesion plus mu into sigma. The shear sliding criterion can be defined with respect to that sort of a, uh, that sort of a basis. So these two failure modes, of course, uh, as I said, mixed modes are possible and you will see a body of literature that tries to understand how to capture the capacity um, and the failure mechanism if you have a combination of modes. You could typically have a combination of modes. You will get, uh, it, it does not mean that right from the beginning of the uh, lateral force displacement, force displacement um, behavior of the wall, that is always going to be uh, shear sliding dominated or diagonal cracking dominated or flexure dominated. It might begin in one, you might get tens uh, tensile heel cracking area of cross section reduces because of the cracking of the, uh, of the critical section and then depending on the axial stress levels, you can also see a change in the, um, in the behavior of the wall. So this is uh, quite possible that you get mixed modes. However, with respect to the diagonal tension failure, again you can have two mechanisms. If the crack is actually, um, if the crack is actually splitting the stone, the splitting the brick, you can have the um, line crack and then uh, if you have the uh, crack not splitting the stone but actually following the 
joint, you will have the step failure and, and here the criterion uh, that matters is the joint shear strength versus the, the bed joint strength versus the uh, unit strength um, in tension itself. So, this is a further um, aspect that needs to be considered as far as the diagonal cracking uh, mechanism is concerned. So, extending the Mann-Muller theory and then using it uh, with respect to these force resultants, the criteria to, def to um, define and have a closed form expression for the two shear failure modes are the maximum principal stress criterion where we are saying that the maximum principal tension when it approaches the tensile strength of masonry you get diagonal cracks and the other failure criterion is based on the Mohr Coulomb criterion for explaining the joint sliding that is occurring in the masonry wall. So, we will examine the formulations based on these two criterion criteria, the first one being the maximum tensile stress criterion. Here if you look at masonry panels that are subjected to both shear and compression, it has, it has been demonstrated that the shear strength of the panel is reached when diagonal cracks are formed and diagonal cracks are formed typically from the center and again I make reference to the manual criterion where we were looking at the tension cracks in the brick unit forming at the center and we had to take into account the dimension of the brick to be able to change the shear stress defined at the joint to the shear stress at the center of the brick unit. So, similarly here typically this sort of a failure mechanism sees the onset of diagonal cracks at the center of the panel and these are diagonal tension cracks, they are due to shear tension which means we can actually use a principal tension criterion to um, estimate the lateral force required to cause this sort of a failure mechanism. So, we are talking of a combination of shear stress developed because of the lateral force in the presence of a normal stress, an average normal stress in the wall sigma z and tau xz assuming we are talking of the xz plane itself. The, uh, the hypothesis in this particular criterion is that shear failure is occurring when the principal tensile stress reaches a value of the tensile strength of masonry. Now again with respect to the Mann-Muller criterion, for the Mann-Muller criterion we were talking of the tensile strength of the brick unit, but here we are interested in the tensile strength of the masonry, right. Now what is the tensile strength of the masonry that is relevant in this context? we are talking of a value that can be established with a test like the diagonal compression test. The diagonal compression test was used to estimate the shear strength of masonry, but in that context I was mentioning that the strength FTU that you estimate from the diagonal compression test is also referred to as the conventional or referential tensile strength of masonry, right. So, this is the sort of value, um, an estimate of the tensile strength of masonry that we are talking of because the failure is in the principal tension itself. So, with this, uh, in this context if you examine the, uh, the Mohr circle, the state of stress uh, in the wall tau xz versus sigma z, tau xz uh, in the, the shear stress and sigma z the um, normal stress gives us our principal stresses sigma t and sigma c principal compression principal tension. This estimate of sigma t is what we require, we equate that to the tensile strength of masonry and we have a, uh, we have a criterion. So, um, the principal tensile stress itself here sigma t is the principal tension, uh, from the Mohr circle you can estimate what is the um, actual value of sigma t itself knowing the uh, value of the shear stress and knowing the value of the uh, average normal stress acting on the wall. This is then equated to FTU that is the uh, tensile strength of masonry, the assembly masonry itself. So, this is the, this is the criterion that we use. Now, of course, the previous expression was defined in terms of stresses, but we are talking of being able to do this in terms of force resultants and therefore we need, we need to now transfer from the state of stress to the force resultants especially to define what is the ultimate lateral force capacity of the wall if it were to fail in a diagonal tension uh, criterion. So, since this crack occurs at the center of the panel, we are interested in looking at the stresses defined at the center of the panel. The normal stress 
uh, at the panel n being the superimposed load divided by the area of cross section L by T uh, L into T and uh, the shear stress. Now the shear stress is going to be affected by the uh, you know that the shear stress distribution in any cross section um, along the height is not uniform it reaches a maximum if you take a rectangular cross section in a beam that is subjected to vertical shear itself you get a, a parabolic distribution with the peak shear stress being at the um, at the neutral axis. So the shear stress distribution is not, not going to be uniform. So working with the average shear stress is tricky because the average shear stress might not be able to give you a value that is close to the value for which cracking is, is going to occur. So this is observed to be affected significantly by the aspect ratio of the wall. Okay. So we introduce an estimate of the shear stress corrected by a factor that actually takes into account what the uh, aspect ratio of the wall is, what is the role of the aspect ratio of the wall is. So while the average normal stress is adopted as it is, for the shear stress we make a correction based on the aspect ratio of the wall. And you know that aspect ratio of a wall has a role to play in um, whether it is going to be dominated by flexural mechanisms or whether it is going to be dominated by shear mechanisms. So um, here tau naught is the average shear stress and you see that the average shear stress is, is nothing but lateral force H divided by L into T. So that is going to give you the average shear stress but there is a deviation from this average shear stress to be able to estimate what is the maximum shear stress. Uh, we use the aspect ratio, uh, we, we bring in the aspect ratio in the form of this uh, constant term B and I will explain what is this constant term in a moment. So um, go back to the previous expression. Now uh, tau xz square that was there in the uh, in the un, uh, second part of the under root is replaced with uh, b tau and we have b tau uh, the whole square and then uh, equate that to the tensile strength of masonry. Now this factor is directly dependent on the aspect ratio of the wall h being the height of the wall and l being the length of the wall and it is observed that it is not possible to get a, um, a, an analytical form of what B should be and researchers who worked on the subject have proposed empirical expressions that take care uh, rather well the effect of the geometry on the state of shear stress causing failure itself. So we are looking at this criterion developed in 1984 where the value of B ranges between 1 and 1.5. When you are looking at slender walls with an aspect ratio greater than 1.5, you take the value as 1.5. So B will have a maximum value of 1.5. When you are looking at squat walls where H by L is less than 1, you, the, um, the wall is longer than it is uh, taller. In such a wall, it is a squat wall, you limit the value of B as 1. So B varies from 1 to 1.5 and in the range 1 to 1.5, uh, I mean in the range of H by L 1 to 1.5, the value of H by L will be taken as B itself. So in the range B 1 to 1.5, it will depend directly on the value of H by L. So with this expression, with this um, value that you can adopt based on the aspect ratio of the wall for B, you will have uh, a number times tau in the under root term and you can uh, use the average uh, stress, average normal stress value and the uh, average shear stress value in this expression and write down the expression in terms of H which is what we require. In the, the first expression uh, for the uh, failure governing, the failure governed by the toe crushing, we had the expression in terms of the ultimate moment but knowing the height of the wall you can estimate what is the lateral force corresponding to the ultimate moment. In this expression again we bring in H into the expression and therefore you can write down the final expression in terms of H um, simplifying the uh, expression in the under root um, in the entire expression. So finally with this expression you will have HU is equal to FTU into the length into the area divided by B with the square root term of 1 plus sigma naught by FTU. So you know the average axial stress, you know the area of cross section of the wall, uh, you know the 
tensile strength of masonry and you have an estimate based on the aspect ratio of the um, of the wall h by l and you can estimate at what value of lateral force is the uh, mechanism of uh, diagonal tension cracking expected okay so that's the second mechanism the third mechanism uh, so in this case the hysteretic behavior in uh, the discussion that we had for the flexural mechanism let's uh, extend it and examine what happens in the shear mechanism we typically see two important things this is again a test that was conducted uh, by one of our master students uh, the wall was made out of uh, blocks it was concrete blocks so you can see a shear failure mechanism in the wall but the two things that you will observe are first the deformation capacity is significantly lower than in a wall which is governed by flexural rocking so the deformation capacity the fact that uh, with shear you're going to get brittle response is true to an extent you will get uh, almost one half of the displacement capacity or the ductility that you were getting with a wall that is governed by flexural rocking mechanism that is the first uh, point the second aspect is you do get energy dissipation which is more than what you would get for flexural rocking now if it is an unreinforced wall you are going to have uh, one single crack that propagates and um, becomes the surface on which the sliding is going to occur and can dissipate a limited amount of, uh, of energy with reinforcement you can have multiple cracks uh, multiple shear cracks that can actually um, help dissipate more energy so the point uh, that you need to note is with respect to the in plane flexural rocking mechanisms displacement capacity is lower for shear dominated mechanisms one almost one half is what you would get and the energy dissipation is comparatively higher uh, in in this mechanism compared to the the rigid rocking mechanism um, of in plane behavior uh, the behavior is therefore brittle in this in this particular case <coughs> okay let's examine the third criterion the third criterion as i said is an extension of the joint failure um, motor joint failure criterion that we examined in, under the man muller uh, set of expressions so we are examining again the normal stress and the shear stress as average stresses but what's important is um, as far as this criterion is concerned uh, we have to examine the shear strength coming from only the compressed zone of the wall which means part of the wall has already cracked and that may be tensile heel cracking right we were talking of mixed modes so it's not like right from the beginning you're going to have shear sliding occurring in the wall given a uh, geometry and given the level of uh, stress axial stress it's not like it's not likely that you have one governing mechanism so let's say you have a wall which is subjected to lateral forces and axial forces and as i mentioned yesterday tensile heel cracking is a serviceability criterion right it's not an ultimate condition so tensile heel cracking might happen depending on how much axial stress is acting on the wall once that has occurred the compressed length of the wall that is available for equilibrating the lateral force and the gravity force is reduced it is on that that you will have to calculate the shear capacity if you're considering uh, a coulomb type criterion right and um, in the earlier situation where you're looking at the diagonal tension failure the calculations were being carried out at the mid height of the panel in the middle of the panel we don't have uh, heel cracking at the middle of the panel we have heel cracking at the bottom of the panel so this is a criterion where one has to be careful about what is the length of the compressed zone in your estimate and uh, to reflect the importance of it i'll just show you that codes when they look at estimating the shear capacity always worked on um, always work on neglecting the zone in tension and keep only the compressed zone to estimate the shear strength um, of a wall so i'm just examining couple of them the euro code um, format which is of course um, based on a different approach in terms of design with respect to the is code in the uh, euro code the shear strength of an unreinforced masonry wall is estimated 
uh, as the shear strength per unit area of masonry f v k is the is the notation for the shear strength of masonry that is used multiplied by the estimate of the compressed length of the wall. So, to check whether uh, a wall has started cracking you will need an estimate of whether the combination of the lateral force and the gravity force can cause cracking and what is the eccentricity and then how, how, how much do you reduce the compressed length of the wall itself. I am just flagging this off because it is an important aspect as you use these equations to estimate the strength according to the Coulomb type failure criterion. So, um, code in this particular case gives the shear strength, the characteristic shear strength of masonry as being the uh, shear strength per unit area into the length of the compressed uh, zone into thickness, so the area of the compressed zone itself. The uh, shear strength itself, the shear strength of masonry itself actually follows nothing but the uh, Mohr Coulomb criterion that we have been talking of uh, even earlier. So, F V k in this particular case is nothing but F V k naught plus 0.4 into sigma d. So, this um, is really of the form shear strength tau is equal to cohesion plus um, mu into friction coefficient. So, this is really of the form that we have seen earlier tau is equal to c plus mu into sigma, which means F V k naught is really the um, shear strength of the joint when there is no axial compression, which is nothing but cohesion itself the bond. So, F e k naught is bond, F e k naught is nothing but C and then the contribution from the um, friction depends on the level of pre-compression. So, sigma d is the average normal stress on the compressed area. Now, if the compressed area is less than the total length, then the, the stress can increase, the normal stress can increase. So, the sigma d is defined on the compressed area and 0 0.4 is the value that codes uh, typically use for brick masonry. Um, friction coefficient. It can it can be higher in reality, but 0.4 is a value that is used uh, in in the definition of a characteristic shear strength of masonry itself. Of course, codes also put a limit on this value. Um, when you might get a higher value of the shear strength per unit area of the material, but um, it's standard practice to to limit this particular value. And there are different ways in which this can be limited. Some codes go empirical, some codes link it to the uh, tensile strength, uh, the compressive strength of the unit. In this particular case, you see that it is about 0 0.065 times the um, compressive strength of the brick unit. It is just, um, it's just some information that uh, will complete the, the picture here. The IS code, what does the IS code do? Mind you, we are working on uh, permissible stresses as far as IS 1905 is concerned. So, IS code defines the permissible stress, the permissible shear stress which you will then uh, compare with the um, level of shear stress due to the combination of loads in the structure itself. And in this particular case, the code uses a value of 0 0.1 plus F d by 6 in this case. And again, you have a limiting value for the permissible shear stress. But here, F d, the value of F d is the compressive stress due to the dead loads. And this is to be calculated only on the compressed area, which means we are neglecting the tension zone. And if you actually look at the form of the expression again coming from a more Coulomb criterion, F s is tau, 0 0.1 is the cohesion. So, the, the code is actually giving a number there and saying look uh, we can we can expect a bond strength uh, of up to of about 0 0.1 MPa as cohesion uh, available within a permissible stresses approach and F d by 6 is the uh, mu sigma component which means the friction coefficient assumed here is about 1 sixth or 0.167 as the friction coefficient available in the estimate of the permissible shear stress. So, this is this is the um, this is the standard the more cool the Coulomb type criterion is the standard approach that is used for uh, shear strength estimate in uh, in different codes across the world. So, a little bit about the um, formulation itself we need to be able to estimate the compressed length which is critical and then it follows the same uh, method that we had uh, used earlier for the Manmuller criterion of a reduced cohesion and a reduced friction coefficient um, 
at the joint. So, we are looking at a wall where the compressed length is now less than um, LC is less than L and based on a linear distribution of stresses, um, we are not assuming that the distribution of stresses starts becoming non-linear because the failure is happening due to sliding shear and we are not at a situation where there is plastification at the compressed toe because of flexural compression. And so, the assumption of uh, the assumption of the distribution of compressive stresses as a triangular distribution is a valid um, uh, assumption here. So, based on the eccentricity of the axial force E and the estimate of the uh, compressed length, we use the expressions uh, based on the classical condition for which cracking is expected to begin. If E by 6 is greater than 1 sixth of the length of the wall itself, then based on the triangular distribution, it is possible based on the geometry itself, it is possible to estimate uh, E or the compressed uh, length itself. Um, we are mind you using um, the uh, estimate of moment as axial force into the eccentricity n into E that we have seen earlier. So, moment is n into E is something that you uh, need to bring in. So, the compressed length is some beta times the total uh, length itself and we have an expression for the uh, length of the compressed zone, the ratio uh, that we need to multiply the length itself with which is which is this uh, part that we have written down L by 2 minus E by 2 and then you see that this can be expressed eccentricity E itself uh, as I said the moment is written as N into E. So, bringing in um, an expression for E as m by n into this equation, we are able to uh, get an expression which now depends on the aspect ratio of the wall. So, the shear span of the wall is brought in here, here alpha v is nothing but the shear span uh, of the wall itself. So, m by h is the moment to shear, shear force ratio. Um, divided by L, uh, we write that down as H naught by L, this M by H, the ratio of the bending moment to the shear force expressed as H naught, H naught by L and therefore, this uh, expression for LC brings in the um, shear span ratio, uh, shear span of the section uh, of the wall itself, the shear ratio of the wall uh, section itself. So, with this estimate of the compressed length, it is on the compressed length that the joint shear failure criterion is going to be um, used and therefore, uh, if we were to use this within the uh, Coulomb like criterion, we are basically saying that the ultimate the shear capacity is because of the cohesion available in the remaining compressed length of the wall in the rest of the compressed length of the wall cohesion is lost, there is no bond anymore and so beta into LT is the area over which cohesion is still active and of course, you have friction coefficient that is fully available to you and uh, mu is multiplied into N. So, we see that we are working uh, on forces here unlike the earlier expression which was in, uh, which was in terms of stresses. So, uh, we are elaborating this expression and bringing in the uh, form of the shear ratio that we had earlier in the form of the shear span uh, H naught of the wall and you have the expression which brings in both cohesion and the uh, friction coefficient and the uh, shear ratio of the wall in estimating the ultimate capacity of the wall. So, this is in uh, sort of a reduced shear strength like we had in the previous case where the friction coefficient and the um, estimate of the cohesion because of the geometry from the center of the block to the uh, top or bottom of the block required a reduction factor based on the geometry of the block. Similarly, the expression that we have here is looking at a reduced uh, strength because of the compressed length being lesser than the overall length of the wall itself. So, this criterion. Uh, typically, will always tell you 
that it's the section that is most compressed uh, because of the maximum moment occurring at the uh, bottom of the wall is where the failure is expected to occur. So this will always be at the bottom most bed joint uh, either and physically also when we do a test we see that it is either the interface between the, uh, the damp proofing cores and the masonry wall or it is one of the first uh, masonry joins themselves. And this particular criterion can be used only for the shear sliding criterion. You cannot use this to predict shear strength of masonry of a masonry wall if the failure uh, that has occurred in the wall is of any other type of failure. That is um, if, it, if the wall were to fail by flexural compression or wall were to fail by the formation of diagonal cracks, this uh, estimate of HU using the Coulomb type criterion is not appropriate. So uh, and the reason why I am raising this word of caution is many codes give only this expression to estimate the shear capacity of a wall. But the shear capacity of a wall depends on the mechanism of failure and um, using it across mechanisms, using this expression across mechanisms will give you erroneous results. So uh, I just flag that off and then close by therefore looking at having examined three different failure mechanisms. What is the shear force axial force interaction for a given masonry wall for different levels of um, axial force acting on the wall. So like we had the man uh, criterion then defined uh, then used to define the failure domain as far as shear stress normal stress was concerned. We do the same thing for lateral force H and axial force N and you actually have three different zones the sliding shear zone, the diagonal cracking zone and the flexural failure zone and you do see that the, sli the sliding shear is typically expected when the uh, level of precompression is low. Diagonal cracking is typically expected when you have intermediate levels of axial compression and flexural failure is expected when you have significant precompression in the wall. So the three expressions that we have developed, the HU for sliding, HU for diagonal. So um, that is the HU for sliding, HU for diagonal compression and that is the, the big curve that you see there is HU for flexure and they dominate in different zones. So if you were given a single panel of a known aspect ratio H by L, known boundary conditions because now when we are talking of alpha V, alpha V directly brings in the effect of um, whether the wall is going to be uh, bending in single bending cantilevered profile or double bending uh, shear profile because the shear ratio, uh, the shear span is going to change. H naught will change, the bending moment to um, lateral force ratio will change depending on whether you have a shear deformation profile or a cantilevered profile. So if I know the overall dimensions and then estimate H by L, I know the thickness of the wall, I know the boundary conditions. So I know whether it is going to be in double bending or single bending and then if I have material properties like compressive strength of the masonry, tensile strength of the masonry, cohesion and friction coefficient and I know the level of axial stress, average axial stress, I have a close formed way of estimating in what mechanism should the wall fail and at what value. So I come to this interaction where axial force is increasing on the x axis. If I know the axial force corresponding to the average level of axial stress, I will be able to estimate okay so if I am somewhere there, I can go and estimate that the axial, um, the shear capacity of the wall is so much kilonewtons and the failure is expected to be in diagonal cracking. You could also be somewhere in between the two, you might lie somewhere there or you might lie somewhere there but which means that your estimates can actually uh, overlap, you are not very sure whether it is going to be one mechanism or the other. You can have those boundary uh, issues but you can also have mixed modes. But this gives you like we would use a PM interaction for a, uh, for a problem of bending compression um, in, in RC design. Here you have something that is shear compression uh, that you can play around with in design and for assessment. Okay. So with that we come to the end of shear capacity for in plane actions 
and we will be looking at PM interactions that can be developed for the unreinforced masonry which will be of use for us later in design of reinforced masonry walls. So uh, I will stop here.